In part two of our five-part sermon series, The Soul Food of a Christian Servant, we're going to talk about the motive and measure of ministry, love and sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come before your people to proclaim your word. I pray, Lord, that everything I'm about to say and do is inspired and instructed by the Holy Spirit so that your truth and nothing but your truth is spoken received and believed in Jesus name. Amen. So we're going to use the backdrop for uh, today's message, uh, John, the 21st chapter, verses 15 through 17, and then we'll move over to Romans, the ninth chapter, verses one through three. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now to Romans, the ninth chapter, verses one through three. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed cut off from Christ, if that would save them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as I shared, shared earlier, uh, Jesus was a self-avowed servant, and he taught that serving others was the way, the proper way to express the love of God for one another. Christian servants do a multitude of things. Among them, model Jesus Christ, glorify God, encourage others in their walk with the Lord, and then in the process, they mature. They grow in their personal walk as a Christian. We grow in our personal walk as Christians. Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give unto you, love one another. So clearly, Jesus thought that loving one another was a good thing to do. And I have to tell you here lately, uh, it is not very difficult at all to encounter people who do a great job of quoting what Jesus said, but they're not very productive when it comes to doing what Jesus said to do. Listen to me, church family. You cannot call yourself a Christian with a mouthful of scripture and a heart full of hate. You just can't do it. Well, you could, but that's not what you should do. There should be no greater motive for being a follower of Jesus Christ than to have the desire to love as Jesus loved, to teach as Jesus taught, to bless like we've been blessed. Love is a good thing, and love is sacrificial. It means putting others' needs before our own. Love is active. It, it means that, that saying you love somebody is more than just the words or a feeling. It's the deliberate actions we take to help one another. And love adds value. It adds value to our relationships. Listen, it adds value to our physical health, our mental health, and so much more. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 and 2, he said, Without love, I am nothing. So what good is it to say you are a Christian and then not try to operate the way God said that we should all operate. So in their book, uh, 10 Power Principles for Christian Service, Warren and David Worsby spell out 10 unchanged principles that lead to good success. The foundation in ministry. of ministry they is say. character. The nature of ministry is service. The motive of ministry is love. The measure of ministry is sacrifice. We'll talk about those today. The authority of ministry is submission. The purpose of ministry is the glory of God. 
The tools of ministry are the word of God in prayer. The privilege of ministry is growth. The power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And the model of ministry is Jesus Christ. So one of the things they say in this book about love as it, as it pertains to being the motive of ministry is that a servant of the Lord cannot minister effectively without it, it being love. And to look out for things that what they call are competing motives, competing motive, motives when it comes to love. If you love attention more than Jesus, they say that is a competing motive. If you love to get accolades about your accomplishments more than praising Jesus Christ and thanking God for his accomplishments, that's a competing motive. If you love money more than Jesus, that's a competing motive. If you love power more than Jesus, that's a competing motive. Glorifying the things you love more than Jesus will never glorify God. What brings glory to God are motives that manifest the power and the presence of God. So let's talk about our text today in the Gospel of John. There are a lot of things I think we could glean from it. One, uh, it is certainly a do-over moment for Brother Peter, but I think most importantly, it's a teaching point for us about why love is so important. So one of the points that uh, John is trying to make in this story is this. If you don't love the shepherd, you cannot really love his sheep. I'll say it again. If you don't love the shepherd, it's going to be hard to love the sheep. So when we uh, pick up the story uh, here in uh, chapter 21, uh, Jesus has been resurrected. The disciples have been told to meet him in Galilee. And so they do. That is where they are when we pick up the story. Uh, Jesus appears to them, but they don't realize that. They're out fishing, not very successfully, and they hear someone yelling from the shore, cast your net to the other side. And they do. And they end up catching a boatload of fish. And when they come ashore, then they discover that that fishing expert is actually Jesus. So they have breakfast together, and then that's when Jesus calls Peter. He calls him out. He says, listen, Peter, you're the same one who denied me three times before the cross. I'm giving you an opportunity for a makeover, to reset our relationship. And then Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Peter's first response is, yes, I love you. You know I love you, Jesus. Then Jesus says, okay, then feed my lambs. The second time Peter responds, yes, you know I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. The third time, uh, Peter responds, Lord, listen, and I think he's a little uptight right now about the fact that Jesus has been persistent about asking him this love question. He says, Jesus, you know that I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my sheep. Jesus is saying to Peter directly, and I believe indirectly to us, either you love me or you don't. And if you say you love me, then you got to act like it. Love others like you love me, even those who have slipped up or messed up, those that may need a second, third, or fourth chance. They need tending to. So why do we need the love of Christ in us? Because we cannot represent the love of Christ if we ourselves are lacking in love. So Warren Worsby uh, in his book uh, says this, he says, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Guess what? We are the loving channels. Ministry motivated by love edifies, it builds up. And not just the person being served, but the servant as well, us. To truly love people, listen, church, we've got to accept them as they are and do our best to identify what they really need. We don't have to approve of their lifestyle. We don't have to dilute their record. It is what it is because Christian love is not blind and it's not hypocritical. 
See, I'm not going to close my eyes to the reality of someone's needs or their challenges. I'm not going to act like everything is fine. It certainly isn't with me. But what I am going to do is open my eyes to see them as someone Jesus Christ died for, just like he died for me, and as someone Jesus Christ can do wonderful new things for, just like Jesus Christ has done wonderful new things for me. Love sees potential beyond the problem. The motive of ministry is love. The measure of ministry is sacrifice. So for the past a couple of weeks, if you've been joining us uh, in our sanctuary here at uh, Ashford, uh, we've been uh, singing a song by William McDowell. It's called, I Give Myself Away. And I think the most compelling part of the lyrics to that song are right here. He says, take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice. All my dreams, all my plans, Lord, I place them in your hands. I give myself away so you can use me. Again, sacrifice is a way to bring glory to God when we give ourselves away. And sometimes uh, giving ourselves away, sometimes bringing glory to God, it's easy. It's easy. But other times, oh, I got to tell you, it comes through sacrifice and it hurts. It's painful. If in the moment the sacrifice, uh, we, we understand it uh, wholeheartedly, uh, what it is and what it's going to accomplish, you know what? We would be a little giddier about grinning and bearing it. But the connection between our sacrifice and God's glory isn't always so evident. And grinning and bearing it is not the preferred option. We don't always want to give ourselves away. But sacrifice can involve our money. It can involve our time. It can involve our, our energy. It can involve our talent. Sometimes we need to change or adjust our schedule. Sometimes we have to give up our lazy boy time or adjust our vacation schedule. In Romans 9, 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul says something amazing. He said he's willing to give up his seat on the bus to heaven if it meant salvation for his people. He says, for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I'd be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Why Paul is saying that is because the nation of Israel had been rejecting Christ. Now, you had a few believers here and there, but for the most part, the overwhelming belief was that trusting the law was the key to salvation and not God's unmerited favor and grace brought forth by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. Paul said he'd rather sacrifice his salvation if it meant salvation for somebody else. And well, that's quite a statement. That's quite a statement. Paul's willing to give his life away, and he did. Now, let me just say this. Being a faithful servant of Jesus Christ does not require us. We don't have to develop a, a non-suicidal suicidal self-injury disorder. I think that's what it's called, non-suicidal self-injury disorder. We don't, we don't have to do that. See, we don't have to come up with ways to sacrifice so that we can brag about our scars. You know, we don't have to uh, self-inflict pain. We don't uh, need to treat our sacrifices like S&H green stamps. If you know, you know about S&H green stamps. Well, we have to earn enough and then cash them in for some bonus blessings. We're not called to do that. It's not about what we get for our sacrifice. No, it's about what we give as a sacrifice. Let's be real. Sometimes sacrifices produced suffering. Sacrifices can produce suffering. But the Bible says that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, character hope. And hope, guess what? It does not disappoint because God's love, L-O-V-E, has been what? Poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
Yeah, some of us have been wounded with our sacrifices, and certainly we cannot identify with the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, we certainly cannot identify with the wounds that Paul endured, but we have suffered, and we suffer sometimes. I mean, just a few examples. You go to work, you work hard all day long, you get the job done, the business prospers, but you never get appreciated. I mean, that, that hurts. You never have a bad word. You don't gossip. You don't backbite about anybody, but everybody talks about you like a dog and you have to sit there and listen to it with no opportunity to defend yourself. It hurts. People constantly misunderstand you, misquote you, and you're never allowed to be given the opportunity to just explain yourself. That hurts. Suffering can weigh us down in big ways and little ways. But God is the great counterbalance for suffering because God doesn't replace suffering with glory. He simply transforms suffering into glory. All things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. If the measure of ministry is sacrifice, and sacrifice can produce suffering, then listen, we need to expect suffering. It's going to happen. As service of God, there's going to be some suffering moments. We should accept it. We should look for God's purpose in it, and then we should trust God with it. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The motive of ministry is love. The measure of ministry is sacrifice. God so loved the world that he sacrificed his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, church, the Lord is not asking any of us to literally hang on a cross for someone else. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to die to selfish ambition and to live out what God expects from us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as we love ourselves. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'd love to pray for you. If you have a prayer concern or a celebration, please send us an email to aumc at ashfordumc.org. Our prayer team is standing by to pray for you. We have multiple ways to give here at Ashford. If you'd love to share a gift with our ministry, please do so. Again, multiple ways to give. They're right there on your screen. You can uh, text to give. Uh, you can go to our website and click the Give button and give that way. You could certainly join us in the sanctuary. That's what we'd love for you to do. Join us in the sanctuary for our worship service at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and uh, you will have an opportunity to share a gift then if you so desire. Lord, I thank you for uh, the gifts and the givers. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for your word that has gone forth. I pray that those that heard it, receive it, and believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us for our virtual service. Again, as I just said, join us uh, in our worship service uh, at 11 o'clock here in our sanctuary at 2201 South Derry Ashford Road. On the west side of Houston, we're on Derry Ashford. We're situated between Westheimer and Briar Forest. We'd love for you to bring your entire family. We have an outstanding children's ministry. Our Kids Zone volunteers are standing by. And then we have our teen quest and those for uh, your youth who are uh, 13 to 18. Uh, uh, we have an outstanding ministry for them. We're going to learn, help them learn how to dissect and understand and apply biblical principles to this wacky world we're living in today. So come on, bring your entire family. I send you uh, forth each uh, week with three questions. Uh, I provide the questions. You know the answers. Who's the head of this church? Jesus. Who is the church? We are the church. And what are we as a church called to do? We're called to serve. God bless you. I'll see you next time.